Welcome everyone. We are so glad to have you here today. My name is Lisa Lunghofer. I'm the executive director of the Gray Muzzle Organization. And I'm joined by my colleagues, Laura Merrick, give a wave, Laura, and Amanda Grant. And we are so pleased to have um, Dr. Sowers here today to talk about Acupuncture 101. So before we get started, I just wanted to let you know that we will field your questions. So please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box if you're joining us on um, Zoom. And if you're joining us on Facebook Live, you can put your questions into the comments and we will try to get through all of them. And if we fail to get to a question or if so you think of something afterwards, we'll, um, I'm sure we'll have some contact information. You can reach out to us and we'll do our best to answer your question. So um, actually, you know, before we start today, I, for, for any of you who are new to Gray Muzzle, I just wanted to really quickly give you a, a, a quick overview of, of who we are and what we do. So we're a national organization and we provide funding and other resources to animal welfare organizations across the country. We are actually just now reviewing our 2022 grant application. Last year, we awarded $616,000 in grants to 77 animal welfare organizations across the country, and we're, we're hoping to do even better this year. And we also provide resources to the public. So this webinar series is part of that um, set of resources. We provide resources on all different topics related to senior dog care from enrichment and wellness to uh, medical treatments and alternative treatments and, and also end of life care and decision making. So we're really pleased that you're here with us today and we are delighted that Dr. Sowers is here. So let me introduce her and then I'll, I'll turn the virtual floor over, over to her. So Dr. Sowers is originally from Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and graduated from the University of Tennessee College of Veterinary Medicine in 2009. She specializes in emergency medicine for almost 10 years, specialized in emergency medicine for almost 10 years before making the transition to general practice and acupuncture in 2018. Dr. Sowers attended the Chi Institute in 2017 and received specialized training in anim animal acupuncture Chinese medical massage and food therapy. She has a passion for integrative medicine and tries to incorporate natural healing into her treatment plans as often as possible, and also has a special interest in using essential oils in pets. She opened Kindred Souls Mobile Veterinary Services in 2018, which exclusively practices traditional Chinese veterinary medicine. She also works part-time at Riversong Veterinary Clinic, an, in, an integrative clinic in Brevard, Brevard, North Carolina. In her spare time, she enjoys hiking, dancing, seeing live music, and visiting um, the many out, art galleries in, in her area of North Carolina. She also regularly practices yoga and um, meditation. So welcome, Dr. Sowers. We are delighted to have you here, and I am really excited to, to hear more about acupuncture and, and learn from you. So I will turn the floor over to you, and we will turn off our cameras. All right. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Gray Muzzle Organization. I'm happy to be here today and uh, teach you guys a little bit about acupuncture, and hopefully um, we can learn, and you know, hopefully it's something that you'll consider for, for your older pet. Um, so I'm going to kind of start with just kind of some basic lingo, um, acupuncture, we call it kind of the practice of acupuncture and it does fall under the umbrella of something called traditional Chinese medicine or traditional Chinese veterinary medicine when we're talking about our pets. Um, and, and we call that TCVM for short, uh, TCVM, it also includes, there's four different things that fall under, uh, traditional Chinese medicine. One, of course, is acupuncture. Uh, the other is Chinese herbs. 
And then we also have something called Twina, which is basically um, a Chinese therapeutic massage that's also based on kind of the acupuncture points and the meridians. And then finally, we have what's called food therapy. So I do try to encompass most, if not all of those things and, you know, everything I do with my patients. Um, and so just also some other things. So Western medicine is really good at kind of treating, you know, acute, uh, infectious, traumatic sort of diseases, um, whereas they don't have a lot of options or uh, aren't very good at, at treating things that are more chronic, that are more debilitating or progressive. So things like arthritis or neuropathies, Western medicine doesn't have a lot of, you know, great uh, treatment options. And usually what you end up doing is just kind of um, putting a Band-Aid on it or, you know, treating the symptoms and not necessarily the underlying cause. So um, Chinese medicine is, is very good at treating those, those chronic diseases and actually getting to the root or the underlying cause of those diseases in some cases. Um, and so that's where it, it excels. Uh, what I really like is integrative medicine, where we take the best of both worlds. So I usually do, you know, Western medicine as well as, as Chinese medicine. Um, in my kindred souls business, it's, it's strictly Chinese medicine. And I do work with uh, local veterinarians so they can have an integrative type approach. And so I do think that's, you know, kind of the best because with integrative, we look at all the aspects of lifestyle, including, you know, diet, exercise, um, emotional health. And so we get a more complete picture uh, and are able to, you know, keep things stable a little bit longer than just focusing on treating the, the symptoms. So what is acupuncture? Um, and to really kind of start, we kind of have to look at um, the difference between there's, so there's two kind of bodies that we have. One is the physical body, which is the one that we're all, you know, used to and can touch and feel and all of that. But on top of that, it, there's another body and that's called the energetic body. And the energetic body is what makes this physical body run. It's also your life force. Um, and your life force in Chinese medicine is called qi and that's spelled Q-I um, and qi, uh, runs through what are called channels or meridians uh, throughout the body, and they kind of go this way through the body. Um, and that's where that energy flows, that chi flows, and that's what makes everything, like I said, makes everything work. And so there's uh, sections along these channels where that chi comes close to the surface. And those areas where that chi comes close to the surface are those acupuncture points. And that's where I'm putting my needles or if we're doing massage, that's where I'm doing the massage. Um, and in those areas, those acupuncture points um, underneath them, there's usually a, a conglomeration of things like nerves, blood vessels, lymph ducts, connective tissue and immune cells. And so I'm basically using that needle to, to stimulate that area, to stimulate the chi, and the energy to move along the channel. Um, you know, scientifically what we're doing is we're stimulating those points to release certain chemicals or substances that basically help the body get back to homeostasis. And so it helps uh, the body to kind of heal itself. Um, and because of that, you can't really make things worse with acupuncture because the body is never going to overcorrect itself. Um, so the, the worst thing that can happen with acupuncture is nothing. And so that's one of the many beauties of acupuncture is that you, know, it's, you, you can't really injure something with that. Um, and going along with that, all disease processes besides trauma, trauma is a little different, um, all disease processes start in the energetic body. And then if they're not corrected or identified in the energetic body, they move on to affect the physical body. And Western medicine can really only, you know, identify and treat that physical body. Um, whereas Chinese medicine, we're actually able to pick up on subtle differences in that energetic body um, before they become an issue. And so that's another beautiful thing about Chinese medicine is being able to pick up on those subtle differences. And oftentimes um, with the energetic body, you know, especially in animals, we aren't really able to, you know, see that because they can't really talk to us. And even as humans, oftentimes we'll have issues with our energetic body, but we just don't know it. So um, something to, to keep in mind. 
So kind of going into the, the therapeutic effects of acupuncture from more of a, a Western medicine kind of standpoint uh, is that the main physiologic effects that acupuncture has are that it increases the interaction between nervous, endocrine, and immune systems. Um, it can help with pain release or pain relief, excuse me. It causes the body to release uh, beta endorphins, endogenous opioids, uh, serotonin, norepinephrine. Um, it can also stimulate the nervous system and regeneration of nerves, which there's not really anything in Western medicine that can do that. And it has actually been shown to stimulate stem cells, um, especially in the nervous system. Um, it can also help with immune regulation. So things like it can increase the white blood cell production, it can increase certain things like interleukin-2 and other immunomodulators uh, as well. Um, it can help with reproduction, which is not, you know, a big issue in our, our older pets because most of them are spayed or neutered. Um, but some other effect, effects that it can have, it can, it's anti-fever, um, working in emergency medicine. When I was getting my training, I actually got to do a lot of neat things with acupuncture, um, and I've seen it bring down fevers, you know, within an hour or so. Um, it can also help with GI regulation, so it can, you know, increase gut motility. Um, it's anti-inflammatory. It can help regulate blood pressure. Um, it's good for stress relief. It can enhance performance and uh, improves microcirculation. So it does a lot of things. And again, kind of going back that it basically is, is stimulating, stimulating our bodies to release certain chemicals or compounds that are gonna help it get back to homeostasis. Um, acupuncture can also improve recovery time and uh, rates for a variety of diseases. And I did see this uh, quite often, especially in emergency medicine dealing with trauma. Um, actually kind of circling back to trauma, there was one thing I was gonna say about that. So with trauma, uh, what's happening there is that you're affecting both the physical body and the energetic body at the same time. And so Western medicine is good at getting that physical body back to where it needs to be or as, as close to normal as it can be. Uh, but oftentimes that energetic body is never, is not completely right or not completely, you know, kind of straightened out. And so that's where acupuncture can still be beneficial in cases of, of trauma. You know, it can't heal a broken bone, um, but once that broken bone is put back together, it can help, you know, align those energetic bodies back to where they need to be so that the body can have all the energy that it needs to heal. Um, and I have definitely seen that, that happen in some cases of trauma through the ER uh, with acupuncture. Um, and in some cases, acupuncture, we will add that in, and usually Chinese herbs, you know, add that into traditional, uh, conventional Western medications, and we can reduce the, uh, the amount of those traditional Western medications that are needed. Um, the best example of that is seizures and epilepsy. Um, I have a couple of patients that were maintaining, you know, their epilepsy and seizures on just Chinese herbs alone. I have some other ones where we've been able to decrease the, the amount of Western anti-seizure medications that are needed. Uh, so that's where acupuncture and, and Chinese medicine can also be helpful. And moving along, um, so there's several different types of acupuncture. So I'm gonna kind of go over those. The, the most common kind, well, first of all, let me back up. So the, the needles that we use in acupuncture are way different than the needles that you know we're used to seeing when we go to the doctor. Um, the needles at the doctor, they're hypodermic needles. They are, um, they're spiky at one end. And with acupuncture needles, they're actually flat on the end. And so because they're flat, they go between the skin cells instead of through it like a hypodermic needle would. Um, I do have a needle. They're about the size of a hair. I don't know that you guys can actually see it because it's really small. So I'm going to try. You can see how tiny that is. Um, very, very small. And like I said, it goes in between the, the cells uh, of that. So the, the most common type of acupuncture that most people are familiar with is called dry needling. And that is all we're doing is just sticking a needle into the acupuncture point and leaving it there. And so we leave it there anywhere from 13 minutes to 30 minutes. Um, and that can be used to treat any sort of condition. And again, the most common type of acupuncture we see. Um, the effects of that can last two to three days, but kind of as we'll talk about a little bit later, the more, the more you do acupuncture, the longer those effects will last because it's cumulative. Um, 
The, the next type of, probably the next most common type of acupuncture is something called electroacupuncture. And it's very similar to a, a TENS unit, um, but it's a much stronger unit. And it's a unit, it's basically also like a, a battery. So you attach you know, one side to one needle and one side to the other, and then it runs an electrical current between those two points. Um, I've had this done to me. For me, it feels really weird and I don't like it, uh, but a lot of people really like it and find it uh, relaxing and a lot of dogs do as well. Um, and basically what that's doing is that it's adding some increased stimulation to those points. So it's a more intense treatment. So that helps it to last longer. So electroacupuncture can last anywhere from two to four weeks. Um, it also helps to increase the, the release of specifically serotonin as well as endorphins. Um, it's excellent for where I use it most often is, is anything neurologic, not anything, but um, neurologic disease, usually intervertebral disc disease um, and painful conditions. So, and, and in older pets, arthritis can, can benefit from electroacupuncture as well. Um, I tend to use it mostly based on the dog's personality because it is a pretty intense treatment and some dogs just won't stand for that. Um, but it's one that I will use uh, as well. Um, the next one is something called aqua acupuncture. And this is where we inject a liquid over an acupuncture point. Usually it's vitamin B12. And the main reason to do that is that it'll actually sit there. It takes five to seven days for that vitamin B12 to um, be dissolved or to be Never, the word's escaping me, absorbed is the word. Uh, and so during that period of time, it'll sit there and stimulate that acupuncture point. So I will do this uh, usually after, you know, a lot of my treatments. And especially if there was a point that just because the dog was laying a certain way, and I tend to, when I do my treatments, I let the dog or the cat kind of get comfortable and then do my points based on that, instead of saying, I want to get this point and this point and making them you know, do that. So um, if there's a point that I wanted to get, but they were laying on that side, then once we get up after treatment, I'll, you know, do that point, or there were just some other things that I wanted to do that I did put needles in, we'll use that. And, and that's something that can last about five to seven days uh, as well. Um, the last one that I'll talk about is a little bit weird, and it's something called hemoacupuncture, um, and there's two different types of it, and this is something that I, I rarely use, but I have used, uh, used it on occasion, and it's, it's, it's neat, but it's, it sounds a little hokey. Uh, so one of the things you can do is hit certain acupuncture points and make them bleed. Uh, there are some points at the tip of the ear. I don't know why that tip of the ear uh, and the tip of the tail that if you hit those points, the animal will bleed. And so it's, you know, bloodletting um, and it, you're not, they don't gush blood. It's just, you know, a couple of drops. Um, and basically what that does is that releases heat. So uh, where I've used it before is in, in, on emergency when we had patients that had fevers that we couldn't get to come down and I would bleed these points. And then within an hour, that temperature would would go down, so it go down to normal. So I've seen it with fevers uh, and some really hot conditions. I've I've used it as well to help the animal cool down. Um, and in horses, we'll use it. It's a really good for clearing stagnation or pain. So we'll use that in horses quite often to to bleed to help them get rid of some pain. Uh, the other way hemoacupuncture is used is you actually. Uh, draw blood from the animal and then inject that blood over acupuncture points. I have never done this. I've never been brave enough to do that. Uh, it's actually supposed to be really good for conjunctivitis and eye issues is to inject it around the eye. But again, I've never, I've never done that. Um, but I still think it's a, uh, it's kind of neat. So kind of moving on to, you know, treatment and what a treatment may look like. Um, the, so Usually what it consists of is I, you know, come in, I do, you know, I'm, I'm mobile, so I come to you, um, or if you were to go to another, you know, clinic and get acupuncture um, as well, this is all kind of the same. So we go over history, just like a regular appointment. We talk about different things, um, what's going on, what your concerns are. Um, I'll ask, sometimes ask some strange questions like, you know, do they like to, um, 
prefer cold areas or warm areas. There's just, you know, about 10 questions that we asked. A lot of them are standard questions that you would expect. Some of them might be a little bit odd. Um, and then I perform, you know, a regular physical exam and also what's called a, a Chinese medical exam. And with the Chinese medical exam, what I'm looking at is I'm looking at tongue color. I'm feeling of the ears to see if they're warm or they're hot. Um, I'm checking pulses. I'm, you know, palpating along the different channels or meridians of the back to see if there's any sensitivities, if there's any, you know, divots or kind of deficient looking areas. And what I'm doing is I'm coming up with something called a pattern diagnosis. And in Chinese medicine, um, they look at, you know, the entire body, that there's five main organs in traditional Chinese medicine. All those organs are related. Um, it's the same organs that we have in Western medicine, and they do have some of the same properties as in Western medicine. But in Chinese medicine, they also have some additional properties. And again, with Chinese medicine, it's really um, looking at how these different order organs interact with each other. Whereas in Western medicine, it's very compartmentalized. Like this is a kidney doctor. This is your heart doctor. This is your GI doctor. Uh, whereas Chinese medicine, again, kind of looks at how all of those things interact. So it's a more complete picture. Um, but in Chinese medicine, we deal a lot with opposites. So hot versus cold, excess versus deficiency. Um, and then things like yin and yang, which I'm sure most everyone has, has heard of. So when I do my exam, I basically come up with a pattern. Um, and most older dogs, we're gonna have a deficiency of some sort um, that may not always be apparent because some deficiencies will have an excess on top of that. But we usually end up with some sort of deficiency. And then based on that, uh, physical exam, I do my acupuncture points on, on that too. And uh, another little thing about the exam, which I you know, kind of hinted at earlier, is that Chinese medicine can pick up on you know, subtle changes to the exam before uh, Western medicine can, can see that. And um, we most oftentimes see that in the pulses. So if I have a deficient dog, they may, the owner may think everything's fine, they're doing great, there's no issues, but I feel the pulses and the pulses should be even if it's a balanced, what we call a balanced animal, balanced dog. But I'll feel that, hey, this right pulse is weak or this left pulse is weak. Uh, and so knowing that there is a deficiency present, it just hasn't shown itself um, in you know, the physical realm or the physical body, I should say. And I know this is not about horses, but I just like throwing this in there. So in horses, we'll do something called a, a scan. And basically in dogs and cats are just too small to kind of do this. Uh, but in horses, we'll, I'll take an, an instrument and just go across different meridians along the neck and the back and the horse will react when I, you know, do certain acupuncture points. And then depending on, you know, what those points are, I can pinpoint pretty much exactly where the problem is. So the problem is the right front hoof, it's the back hock, it's, you know, the sacrum, it's this or that. And, and things that a, you know, a Western uh, equine vet would not be able to pick up on. And then the other cool thing about that is that you can put acupuncture needles in and then go back and do that scan again. And you can see that the horse is no longer reacting or that reaction is much lower. It's really neat for owners to see. It's neat for me to see uh, as well. So, but we can't really do that in dogs. Um, what I will normally do though, is once we put needles in, once I take them out, I'll feel their pulses again. And more often than not, I can feel a change in those pulses. So what was, you know, weak is now stronger. Um, sometimes the color of their tongue will change to a, a more healthier color. Uh, so you can see those things in, in dogs and cats as well. It's just not quite as horses are so big. It's, it's a lot more uh, or a lot easier to see. So um, once we put, well, once I, you know, figure out what needles we're going to do, we'll put the needles in. Most dogs and cats actually tolerate this really well. Um, if you've ever had acupuncture, you'll know most of the needles don't hurt. Um, sometimes you'll feel a little sensation just that, you know, something happened there, but it's not necessarily a pain. Uh, now there definitely are needles that can hurt. Um, and usually it's no worse and much less than, than a bee sting. Um, but oftentimes what the, the reaction that we're seeing in animals is something called day chi, which means the arrival of chi or the arrival of energy. And so again, it's just kind of a sensation that something happened, but it's not necessarily painful. Um, so sometimes dogs will kind of like look around or you'll get, um, when you put the needle in, you'll get a, 
a little fasciculation or a tremor in that back muscle. Um, and they may kind of, you know, wiggle a little bit with that. Um, I've definitely had dogs that, you know, put a needle in and try to bite you. Uh, that's, that's pretty rare, but that, you know, it can happen. Um, but most animals once, you know, they, like I said, they tolerate the needles really well. Um, and then a lot of animals will lay down and go to sleep. Some don't, um, but, you know, depending on what we're doing, the needles stay in anywhere from 13 minutes to 20 minutes. If we're doing electro acupuncture, you know, that usually lasts about 20 minutes. Um, and then we pull the needles out and then I'll either do, sometimes I'll do that aqua acupuncture following that. And then we talk about, you know, different, um, massage techniques that we can use and sometimes food, um, Following acupuncture, some patients can be groggy or sleepy that first 24 hours. Um, some patients will actually get energized. Uh, my husky that I had for almost 16 years after every acupuncture appointment, she was just energized. She just was very, very spicy for 24 hours after that. So each animal is, is different, but most of them will get, get a little bit sleepy. Um, rarely that 24 hours after acupuncture, they can get worse. And that's something we kind of call, we, what we call a healing crisis, which basically means that we kind of move too much energy uh, for, for them to handle all at once. Uh, but if that does happen, that's only happened once or twice to me in five years um, that will, you know, usually the following day they're, they're much better. And so, and then I know next time, oh, that was too many, too many needles for, for that dog. Um, usually after the first acupuncture appointment, we will see some improvement. It's not always improvement in what you think it might be. So um, it may not necessarily be improvement in mobility, but most owners do report, you know, they just seem happier. They seem to have more energy. They're eating better. They're just, you know, just seem to act better um, with that. And so Sometimes as far as, and kind of that leads me into, you know, number of treatments and that really does depend, you know, if we're dealing with an acute condition, um, which is not usually the case in our, our older pets that, you know, an acute lameness that sometimes just a couple of treatments are needed and, and the more acute condition, the closer we want to do our, our acupuncture treatment. So for something like an acute lameness, uh, we might do, you know, one treatment now, one treatment in two to three days, and that might be all that animal needs. Uh, in most cases, and again, dealing with our geriatric pets, um, what we recommend doing is three or four treatments, you know, fairly close together. So that that's usually one to two weeks apart. Um, and then following those three to four treatments, depending on how they're responding, we try to um, extend the, the time frame out. So extend it to, to three weeks and see how they do, and then extend it to four weeks. Uh, most of my own older pets are on, you know, maintenance treatment anywhere from four, you know, four weeks to six months, but I would say most of them are probably around three to four weeks for, for maintenance. Um, and that, like I said, most time we'll see improvement after the first treatment, but sometimes it can take three to four treatments to really see improvement. And there is a small subset of the population that does not respond to acupuncture. It's less than 5%. Um, I've had two cases over the past five years that, that didn't uh, seem to respond to acupuncture. Um, but if we're not getting the, the um, results that we want, there could be a couple of things happening. One, you know, again, it might not be someone that that's gonna respond or some animal that's gonna respond. Um, sometimes there's a structural issue. And so if there is a structural issue, uh, acupuncture can help so much, you know, it can, it can help a little bit, but until that structural issue is resolved, it's, it's acupuncture is not necessarily going to be beneficial for that. Um, and then sometimes and in certain diseases, all we're able to do is slow progression of that disease and not necessarily make it better. Uh, degenerative myelopathy is, is one of those conditions and that's a condition it's basically Lou Gehrig's disease of, of dogs, most commonly seen in shepherds, and it's a degeneration of the nerves in the hind limb. Um, in those cases, um, you know, we're never, ever, never able to make those dogs better, uh, but I have had several cases where we're able to significantly prolong their, their lifespan with a good quality of life, um, and that's really our goal with acupuncture is that that quality of life for however long, you know, that that may be. Um, and I've just like I said, seen it help a lot of different things. Um, so now I'm going to kind of move on to, you know, the things that it can help. Um, by far, the most common thing that I treat in older dogs is going to be hind and, hind and weakness. And hind and weakness can 
encompass many things. Um, oftentimes it's a combination of, of both a, a muscle, musculoskeletal condition like arthritis uh, and some sort of nerve condition. Um, and nerve conditions, we can see things like chronic, it's called chronic intervertebral disc disease or a chronically bulged disc um, that's putting pressure on that spine can cause that, that hind end to be weak. Um, dogs, I do also think they get what's what I call an age-related neuropathy. It's not necessarily a diagnosis in, in Western medicine, uh, but just naturally as, as dogs get older, their hind end just gets weaker. Um, there is an explanation for that in, in Chinese medicine, but it's a little complicated. I won't get into it. Um, but in my experience, I think it's, it's usually a combination of both arthritis and have age-related neuropathy. Um, other kind of neurologic diseases that it's great for, or this is not necessarily neurologic, but chronic neck and back pain is uh, benefited through acupuncture, um, acute and intervertebral disc disease. So if you have a, a, a a dog that's you know down all of a sudden and can't move. Um, acupuncture is excellent for that, and especially electroacupuncture. I've seen you know dogs that were completely down, you know, within 24 hours are able to stand. Um, you know, and that's not always you know not always guaranteed, uh, but it, it it works really well for especially acute neurologic conditions and even chronic ones. Uh, vestibular disorders. I've had really good success with acupuncture and an old dog vestibular disease, which. Uh, uh, for those of you that, that don't know or may not have had experience with it, um, it's a condition of older dogs where their vestibular system suddenly becomes inflamed um, and they can have a head tilt, they're act drunk. A lot of owners think that the dog had a seizure or a stroke. Stroke is technically a cause of old dog vestibular disease, but not a very common one. Uh, but acupuncture can significantly improve um, the recovery time on that is in severe cases without acupuncture, it can take weeks or even months for dogs to recover. And I've seen, you know, really severe dogs recover within a couple of weeks. So it's really good for that. Um, seizure disorders, it can be beneficial, whether it's, you know, it's epilepsy from a young age or even older dogs that, that get seizures, it can be beneficial. Um, I also do quite a bit of uh, ACL tears and in older dogs, if they get ACL tears, oftentimes surgery is just not, you know, either feasible or, you know, I don't want to say worth it, but it, you know, may not be worth putting them through that, or you don't want to put them through that at their age. And I've definitely had some older dogs recover with acupuncture and Chinese herbs uh, with ACL tears. Uh, cancer is another area that I see quite a few patients with. And with cancer, we can either use that as a primary treatment, uh, in which case we use both Chinese herbs. There are, excuse me, anti-cancer herbs. There's herbs to boost the immune system. Uh, but I also talk about, you know, food therapy um, and doing different sort of supplements with that if we're doing primary care. And acupuncture and herbs can help boost the immune system so that it can fight off the cancer itself. And also, like I said, it has anti-tumor you know, tumor effects to it as well. So we can slow things down. There's also some topical herbs. So if you have an older pet that has a cancerous mass, even if it's, it's, if it's benign or malignant, if you have a mass that's, you know, maybe they're just not able to remove it due to their age or location. Uh, there are some great topical Chinese herbs that can be used to, um, to, slow the progression of that tumor. Um, in some cases, we're able to, to shrink the tumor a little bit. And so uh, that's, that's always an option as well. And then we can also use acupuncture as uh, a adjunct to traditional um, cancer treatments like chemotherapy and surgery. Uh, and, and usually in those cases, we're using acupuncture and herbs to kind of mitigate the side effects of chemo. So it can help improve appetite. It can help, um, you know, if there's diarrhea, uh, if there's weight loss, um, and just, you know, kind of, again, kind of help with those side effects. Nausea um, is beneficial for that. So those are kind of the main ones I see. Um, some other things that, I mean, really acupuncture and Chinese herbs can help with, with virtually anything that, that you can think of. Um, another place, my own personal dog has chronic bronchitis and she's older and there's not really good treatment options in Western medicine besides steroids. And so Chinese herbs and acupuncture have been really beneficial for her. It's great for asthma and cats. Um, cognitive, excuse me, cognitive dysfunction or dementia is another area that I see a lot of patients with. 
Um, I will say for that particular disease, that one's pretty hard to treat in both Western and, and uh, Chinese medicine. There are some herbs for that. I've had some okay success with using an integrative approach for cognitive dysfunction, but hasn't been my, um, I wouldn't say it excels at, at that, but I don't think anything does. And then laryngeal uh, paralysis is another one that I feel like we can slow the progression of in older dogs, but I haven't had a ton of success in, in necessarily making them better. Um, but it does depend on when, you know, when I see them. So if it's fairly early on in the disease process, I have been able to reverse some things, but if it's later on, then it's, it's harder to reverse. Um, GI stuff. So if you have pets that just have kind of vague chronic GI signs that you just can't seem to, you know, get a diagnosis for or um, seem to control. They're having flare-ups here and there. Acupuncture and herbs can be great for that. Um, megacolon, constipation, and cats uh, is, is popular as well. And it's also great for appetite stimulation. I think I already talked about. Um, I do have a few patients that are that are heart patients that have heart failure, congestive heart failure. Uh, in those cases, any sort of heart stuff, it's almost always integrative, meaning that we use both Western and, and Chinese medicine, but I've been able to significantly slow the progression of congestive heart disease uh, in dogs. Um, I do have a few dogs that we're treating with Cushing's. Uh, Cushing's is also another one of those that that we usually do an integrative approach. And, and cats, I know we don't have a ton of cats in here, but cats, um, chronic kidney disease, it, you can help slow the progression of that and even in dogs too. Um, and that's it, but trauma, I can also help with wounds. Um, and as far as you know, contraindications, there's really no contraindications to acupuncture. Uh, there certainly are dogs and cats that refuse treatment. That's probably the biggest contraindication. And I usually, I don't wanna force it on animals. So I really want them to, you know, not necessarily, I want them to enjoy the treatment, which is not always, you know, possible, but I at least want them to not be fighting it the whole time. And so if we have a patient that's very anxious or, you just can't really settle down, um, or you know, one that's that's aggressive. Um, then it, acupuncture may not be for them. Um, there are some things that we you know do avoid with acupuncture. So if a, a patient has a seizure disorder, excuse me, we don't do electroacupuncture. We don't do acupuncture around tumors because that can uh, bring blood supply to them. Um, we avoid certain points if you know animals are pregnant, which again, not usually a big issue for, for us, uh, but kind of, again, circling back around, what we're doing is getting the body back in homeostasis. And so again, the body is never gonna overcorrect itself to the opposite direction. So it's, you can't really hurt anything. Um, so I'm gonna stop, that's pretty much it. I do have, you know, some kind of massage techniques that, that we can go over. That's kind of my acupuncture um, spiel. So I guess I want to see, do we want to just move on to massage techniques? Um, we do have a couple of questions. Okay. So maybe we can run through those and then we, sure. we have about 22 minutes left. So I think we have some time. So okay. one question is why don't vets include acupuncture more and why is it so expensive? <laughs> uh, both very good questions. Um, you know, I, the, the first one, I think, and this is with myself included, is that we're taught, when you're taught in Western medicine, you're taught, you know, there's certain things that you wanna do what's called evidence-based medicine. Um, and so a lot of us get stuck in that. And there is a lot of research um, with acupuncture, but our kind of gold standard and what's called evidence-based medicine is something called a you know, double-blinded placebo-controlled study. And that's something that's very difficult to do uh, with acupuncture. And so I think there are just some, and it happens in human medicine too, is that some people were just so instilled with that Western medicine philosophy that it's really hard for us to um, you know, think of something like acupuncture as being beneficial and helpful, especially if we're not getting that you know, solid research that that we wanna see. Um, and I was a big skeptic too. Like if you told me 10 years ago that I was gonna be you know, speaking about acupuncture to a webinar, I probably would have laughed at you because um, I didn't believe it, really believe in it either until I had you know, great experiences with my, with my own acupuncture as well as acupuncture on my dogs. Um, and so it's just hard for some doctors to be open-minded about that. Um, I'm actually quite shocked in my area that there's not more you know, owners doing acupuncture or veterinarians doing acupuncture. Um, and I live in a pretty um, 
kind of, I would, I guess, hippie area, <laughs> yeah, very into natural healing kind of stuff. And so I don't really know um, why it's not more popular. It is gaining popularity um, and it is becoming more and, and more more and more easier or easier to, to find clinicians that do it. Um, as far as cost, um, so there's, that's a, that's a tough question. <laughs> I don't know how to answer this tactfully. Um, and, you know, in, use, in acupuncture in humans, humans are able to talk. And so they can tell us um, things that, that animals can't tell us. And so there's a little more finesse, there's more knowledge that needs to go into um, working with an animal and, and just, you know, so to be a human acupuncturist, you do not have to go to medical school. You can just go to acupuncture school, get your certification and you can practice on people and animals. You have to be a veterinarian in order to practice acupuncture on animals. And it took me a while to kind of figure out why, why that's the case, but it kind of goes back to that, that animals can't tell us what's going on. So you need to be um, astute as to what's normal and what's abnormal in a dog because they can't tell you. Um, and so because of that, I think that what we do is, is highly specialized. There's not very many of us that do it. And so that's going to, you know, our, our work is valuable. So we're going to charge a little bit more. Um, and the reality of it is, you know, with my patients, I tend to get them at the end of their, of their life. So I might have 10, you know, 10 sessions with them um, and just logistically for me to be able to eat and drink and, and do all that sort of things, I have to charge a certain price to be able to do that. And especially if I'm traveling and I'm going to, to patients. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. And I, I hope that answered the question. Great, no, that was helpful. Um, uh, Amy asks, how many sessions do you try acupuncture before deciding if it is going to help? Um, four is usually my, my cutoff, um, with that. And so if we're seeing absolutely no improvement after four sessions, then we have that conversation, you know, is it worth continuing on? And sometimes what happens is we decide, you know, no, let's not continue on. But then I get a call three to four weeks later and they're like, wait a minute, my dog's suddenly getting worse. So it, it actually, and we've restarted acupuncture. So in some cases it doesn't seem like they're getting better, but we are slowing that progression. And once we stop it, then owners can kind of see that, Hey, yes, maybe this was helping. Um, but that's you four is usually my, my cutoff for that. And then we just have one sort of specific question. Um, Susan asks, my 10 year old Yorkie has fixed displaced kneecaps. They often seem to lock up, but will pop back to where he'll stop limping. Could he benefit from ac acupuncture and or herbs and or diet? Arthritis is also a factor. Yes, 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 and yes. <laughs> so um, luxating patellas, which is, is what you're describing where the kneecap goes in and out, um, that is a ligament disorder. And so there are some, some herbs, there's one I use called uh, tendon ligament, which can help to strengthen those, those ligaments. Um, usually if it's more of a chronic thing and that arthritis has developed, I usually do a combination of that herb and then something for arthritis, but acupuncture can definitely also be beneficial with that. Uh, as well as, as food therapy. So all of those things can, can be beneficial. Great. Okay. I think those are the main questions for now. So. Okay. Um, want to do some massage techniques. Great. All right. So we're going to bring on, uh, my assistant. I've got to wake her from her nap. Good. This is Tater. <laughs> so, uh, one of the first Technique. So this is one um, that is actually can be used for cognitive dysfunction. It's also good for neurologic, anything neurologic. It's very easy. Um, it's just on the top of the head and you do, you just do circles with your palm and you do it 12 times clockwise and then you'll do it 12 times counterclockwise. And that stimulates, it stimulates all the nerves of the head so like I said, it's great for cognitive dysfunction or any sort of nerve dysfunction. Um, some calming points that you can do for kind of massage. Uh, there's one at the, it's the back of the ear, kind of right here, there's a divot. I don't know if you can see that and it's on both sides. So it's something called on shin. So massaging both of those can help, can help your dog to relax. Um, there's also all across the top of the skull right down the center, all of those are calming points, calming acupuncture points. And so I've actually used this, you know, in the clinic when dogs are 
you know, being held for different things and they might be kind of freaking out, but just kind of sit there and gently going down that, that, oh, sorry, <laughs> down that midline. See how calm she is now? <laughs> um, can, can calm them. Uh, another calming point is just, oh, geez, she doesn't want to do that, is uh, just above the wrist here on the outside. This is called heart seven. And if you stick your, there's a little divot there. If you stick your finger in and just kind of hold that and you can use your thumb on the other side for pressure as well. Just kind of hold that there for, you know, 30 seconds to a minute. That's also a, a good calming point. Um, and you can rub things like essential oils on there and essential oils, that's a whole nother kind of bag to get into, which you don't have time to do today. But those are some calming points. The other ones that are good for especially older dogs that have some hind end weakness. If there is a point, sorry. <laughs> so right above the hock, there's a, this thin fleshy area right here. This is called the aspirin point. It's also, it's called the um, source point for the kidney. And the kidney is the organ that tends to get weak uh, as dogs get older. And so taking this area and just holding it, you know, holding it for 30 seconds, 60 seconds, you can even do circular motions like that. Um, doing that once to twice a day can, can help with pain. It can help uh, strengthen that, that hind end. Um, and then another one that kind of goes along with that, that's also really good for hind end weakness. And this one is just under the, the back paw pad. So you can either do put your finger right here and do pressure or even on the paw pad itself. Again, kind of tiny circular motions or just putting consistent pressure, 30 seconds, 60 minutes, or as long as they'll, they'll tolerate. Um, that can also help with uh, that, with hind end weakness. And another one that I don't think Tater's gonna cooperate for right now, but we'll see. So along the back, there is a, what's called the bladder meridian. And it's, it's, there's points here that can, that communicate with all the organs, all the different organs of, of the body. Um, so one of the things you can do to kind of stimulate all of those organs every day, if your dog will tolerate it, is just kind of picking the skin up. You know, we're going uh, transfer or same parallel with the the back. She's not a very cooperative patient today, but just kind of picking that skin up, holding it for a second and doing that all along the spine. Um, that will stimulate all those points. So kind of going up and down, you know, two to three times once a day. The other thing, the other one, which is a little bit harder to demonstrate here, but we're going to try. It's called uh, back rolls or neck rolls. And I'm going to make it look really easy. It's not this easy and it does take some practice and some dogs, depending on um, what their condition is, this can be a little bit uncomfortable. So some dogs may not tolerate this at first. Um, but basically what I'm doing is I'm pinching the skin and I'm with these fingers, I'm pushing. And with these fingers back here, I'm pulling. So we're going, we're just kind of rolling it like that. And if there's a lot of scar tissue along the back, this will be hard to do initially, but the more you do it, the easier it'll get and the better they'll feel, but that's a more intense, and there she goes, and she's done. <laughs> um, but that's a more intense stimulation of, of all of those points um, along, along the spine. A, another one for, not another one, but one you can do for appetite. And this is uh, actually really good in, in cats too, is, and they may or may not tolerate it, but on the tip of the nose, you'll see there's like an indent. It's right between where the, the fur comes down and where that, you know, the, the little pigmented part of the nose. <laughs> Tater's not really tolerating it, but there is a little divot there and just kind of doing little circular motions. See how she loves it. <laughs> uh, and that area can help stimulate, can help stimulate appetite. And final one, if you have a dog that has um, collapsing trachea, or I'll use this on tater for chronic bronchitis, if they have a cough, uh, there's two great points that you can um, massage that can 
help you stop that cough. Um, one, it's actually easiest to show on, on me, but if you feel the dog's sternum and you go straight up, you'll feel a hole and it's right here on us. So on her feeling of her sternum, there's a hole right here. So that's one point. The other one is you follow the neck back to right, right before the shoulder blades. It's kind of right at the front of the shoulder blades. So you hold this point as well as that point underneath and you can do circular motions and you can do that for 30 seconds to 60 to 60 seconds while they're coughing and that can help stop them from coughing. Um, it works you know, about 50% of the time and sometimes it works better than, than others, but uh, that's something that you can kind of do at, at home uh, for any kind of cough. So there's also, and I'll put this in some, some notes for the webinar today, but there's a, a great YouTube video. It's called the top 10 uh, tween on massage techniques for dogs. It's a, a Dr. Mitzi Vargas, and she was one of the uh, teachers at the, the Qi Institute where I you know, studied Chinese medicine. Um, and so that's a great video, but I'll put that into uh, the show notes um, as well. So that's it for here. <laughs> and open it up to, to more questions. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yes, we have a couple more. Um, my 10 year old Swissy has become weak in his back hips and splays like Superman sometimes as his back legs go out from under him. He's on Adequan shots, which he's had some success. Would acupuncture possibly provide additional help? Yes. Um, and that one does depend on, you know, I, I've seen quite a bit of success with hind, hind and weakness and acupuncture. Like I said, that's probably one of the primary things that I treat. Um, the only, you know, the, the one condition where, like we mentioned earlier, that really acupuncture can't help as far as hind and weakness is that degenerative myelopathy, um, which is not a very common thing in, in Swissies. I have seen actually a couple of Swissies with, with that disorder. Um, and in those cases, all we're able to do is to kind of slow that, that progression of that disease. Um, but it can be beneficial for improving quality of life. But in most cases with hind and weakness and older pets, we are able to make them better. Okay. And then we have another question. Um, the last vet my late great geriatric 17 year old Dutch Shepherd saw was a traditionally trained vet who'd taken up acupuncture. After she saw his x-rays, she explained he had the worst case of spondy, spondylosis she never seen. He had several treatments as well as some herbs. He objected forcefully to being needled in his nose, so he wasn't. If he'd accepted this, what would needles in the nose have accomplished? He was put down several months later. Needles in the nose. Um, I mean, the only points I know around the nose that the one that we talked about for appetite, um, there are some points on the side of the nose for allergies like sinus congestion I'm not really sure <laughs> what those would have had to do with that particular condition there are 342 acupuncture points I think is the number 340 something um and I you know do not know what they all do uh so <laughs> um that I, like I said I can't think of of what that would be for but but I don't uh, know everything. And there's lots of specialized points. And then depending on what school you went to, um, you know, they, there's still different types of, just like, you know, Western medicine, there's different ways of, of practicing acupuncture. Um, one of the ways and, and the way, main way I was taught was more kind of a balanced approach where you do um, in a, what's called local acupuncture plus distal acupuncture. So local acupuncture would be putting needles around the area of the problem. So I have shoulder pain. So I'm going to put needles around my shoulder. That's local acupuncture. Um, what distal acupuncture is, is that I have shoulder pain, but I'm going to put a needle down in my foot because I know that this channel over the shoulder connects to a channel that goes to the foot. And if I put a needle in the foot down here, that can help clear that whole channel. Um, and so I do a combination of both. I do local as well as distal. Um, I also do what the balanced approach, which is basically you make sure you put needles in all four quadrants of the dog. So there's one, you know, on both front legs, one on both back legs, if I can, assuming I can get to them and the dog tolerates that. Um, but even within acupuncture, there's there's different you know ways to to practice that, and we weren't all trained. Doesn't and neither 
you know, none of the ways are wrong or right. Um, it's just different ways that we're trained. Uh, and, and so that's, I don't know if that helps with anything either. <laughs> Um, and we have a question from Shelly about acupuncture and massage techniques for a dog with hips, hip dysplasia. Would it be beneficial mainly for just pain, for just the pain? If we opt for hip surgery, would acupuncture be an aid used for healing after surgery? Um, I'll answer the last one first. Yes. So acupuncture, um, and I've done this with a, a couple of, of patients, acupuncture post-op can significantly improve the recovery time. Um, and I've seen that happen, you know, multiple times. So yes, that, that could help the acupuncture and massage with the hip dysplasia. It does mainly help with pain. Um, and so it, it can help just keep, and also can help with, you know, keeping up muscle mass, um, and, but yeah, pain would be the main, you know, reason to do massage. Um, and then as far as surgery, you know, I can't speak to, to specific, you know, cases regarding that and just, you know, but if it's severe enough that it's, it's really affecting their quality of life and there's a severe structural abnormality there, then again, acupuncture um, can only help so much that if that structural abnormality is not, you know, fixed or if it can't be fixed, um, then you're just going to get you're only going to get so far. Uh, with that. So, but if your pain is controlled, even if you have, you know, an abnormal gait, you know, does it really matter if you're, you know, happy and healthy otherwise, you know, to me, no, but um, it would depend on the severity of the, the condition. So, um, We have one question. I think it's referring to the massage techniques. It's about, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Some, um, commentary about the UPS man. Um, it, <laughs> Um, uh, the question is, is, is it the same for cats? So I'm, I'm guessing that's the massage. Um, yes. Yeah, so I probably, most cats would probably not like the back rolls. Some cats might. Uh, cats would tolerate the pulling. Some cats would tolerate the pulling of the skin along the back. But the other points, the point on the nose, definitely is the same and all the rest of them are all the same in, in cats. Um, and cats, that point, um, my, my wiener cat um, and cats, since a lot of them have kidney disease as they get older, this is a great point. The one that's above the hawk, that's a great point for cats because that really helps with, with kidney stuff. Um, but yes, they're all the same and the points, all the points are extrapolated, you know, they're the same for cats and dogs. I don't see any more questions. Amanda or Laura, do you see any that I missed? I don't. All right, well, that was really interesting. I, I felt like I learned a lot. So thank you so much, Dr. Sowers. We really appreciate your time and sharing your expertise. And um, we did have some comments in the chat, so I didn't read them all, but from people who had, had tried acupuncture and were having some, some great results. So, so thank you so much for sure, educating us about what, what some of those options are. You're welcome. Yeah. And I do have kind of a summary of kind of what I talked about that I can send you. And then the, you know, that, um, the, the video for the tween awe techniques and dogs, the YouTube video, I'll send that link as well in the next week or so. Great. And we'll, we'll be happy to share that with, with all the people who were on today and those who signed up who will tune in later. So thank you for your time. Thanks everybody for joining us. Thank you for your supportive gray muzzle and your love for senior dogs. We'll see you next time. Take care. Bye. Bye.